is Anthony Markham. I'm a research associate here at the R Street Institute. Thank you for joining us for our May edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group monthly meetings. It's a joint project between the R Street Institute and the New America Foundation. Uh, we gather right here on the Hill to talk about a variety of topics regarding Congress and congressional reform. But this time we're going to bring in another branch. We're going to bring in the judiciary. And I think it should be an often interesting discussion. Um, often when we talk about separation of powers issues, we think of that dynamic between Congress and the executive and all of the interesting issues between these two branches. But we also need to think about the complicated relationship between Congress and the courts. And uh, this issue is timely for a number of reasons. We can think of the nomination and confirmation of federal judges has been a hallmark of the Trump administration. In the first term so far, there have been over 100 district and circuit judges confirmed. Um, two Supreme Court justices have been confirmed. Many of these confirmations have turned into huge political battles, most notably the recent confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, but other clashes, such as rules changes and the blue slip, have also become front page news. Um, perhaps in part of these episodes and prior instances of political battles surrounding the courts, court reform in general has become a huge part of the pre um, Democratic presidential primary platforms. Most notably, we're seeing proposals to add seats to the Supreme Court, impose term limits on justices, and so these episodes have raised a number of interesting questions. First, are these ideas good? Second, have these political battles damaged the court's legitimacy? Third, is there anything Congress can do about it? And fourth, what is that? And so to help perhaps answer some of these important questions, I've brought along three panelists with us today. The first to my left here is Gabe Roth. Gabe is the executive director of Fix the Court, the nation's only nonpartisan organization focused on modernizing the federal judiciary and holding it accountable to the American people. Previously, Gabe had several political consulting jobs in New York, D.C., and Chicago. Originally from Nashville, Gabe began his career as a producer at an NBC affiliate in Jacksonville, Florida, and has degrees from Washington University in St. Louis and Northwestern. At the end of the table, we have Dylan hetler Gadet. Dylan is the External Affairs Associate with the Constitution Project on the Project on Government Oversight. Um, in this role, he works with external partners and manages a broad coalition, all dedicated to the defense of judicial independence. Dylan spent his career pursuing the common good in the nonprofit space, working, for example, at a global anti-poverty organization and a disability rights group. Dylan was born and raised in Maine. He completed a political science degree in economics at the University of Southern Maine and attended graduate school in Northeastern, where he obtained a master's in international relations. And to my immediate ref, left, or my right, is Tara Grove. Tara is a professor of law at William & Mary, where her research focuses on the federal judiciary and the separation of powers. She's published with such law journals such as the Harvard Law Review, Columbia Law Review, and University of Chicago Law Review. Professor Grove's articles are cited and discussed in leading federal courts casebooks, and her scholarship has received national recognition. Professor Grove received her undergraduate degree from Duke University in law, degree from Harvard Law School. After law school, she clerked for Judge Garza on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and served as an appellate attorney at the Department of Justice. Before teaching William & Mary, she was an assistant professor at Florida State. And so to begin and hopefully have this put this discussion in context, I've asked Professor Grove to give us first a brief overview of her essay, which will soon be published in the Harvard Law Review. It's titled The Supreme Court's Legitimacy Dilemma. Um, I think that'll provide some helpful context for the rest of our discussion. So I'll turn it over to Professor Grove. All right, thanks very much. And, and thanks to all of you for, for coming. So as Anthony let off, these are not really good days for the United States Supreme Court. People are talking about things like ending up tenure, impeaching justices, taking away Supreme Court jurisdiction, maybe disobeying federal court orders, and most commonly, and with increasing popularity, packing Supreme Court by adding on additional justices. And I think we all know about the impetus for some of these, some of these recent attacks on the court. Um, there are real concerns about recent fights over judicial confirmations, particularly those involving Merrick Garland, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh. Um, and a lot of people are, are very upset about the way those things went, one way or the other. And so there are attacks on the courts. And what I argue is that this creates a legitimacy dilemma. And it has two parts. And I'm actually going to start with a second. Um, so there, there are two possible futures for the federal judiciary. One is a future where the court becomes a political football. 
when a new party takes over in 2020, there may actually be packing. Um, two more justices might be added to the Supreme Court. Um, that might well might well spur a tit for tat for the United States Supreme Court, such that the party that dislikes the court packing will then try its own court packing or other court probing measures. And the Supreme Court becomes um, <coughs> the, the non-player in this tit for tat game, uh, becomes the pawn in this game, and things do not look good for the Supreme Court. And that will affect the Supreme Court's legitimacy because rather than seeing the court as an independent player, people will start to see the court as a political entity itself. I think some people already do see the Supreme Court that way, um, and that would only get worse. So that is one possibility, that court curbing will succeed. And that would be a very new thing in our society because court curbing historically has not succeeded in the United States, and particularly not in the last half century. And that's something that I've documented with historical research. But there's another possibility, um, and this is the one that I actually, actually spend the bulk of the essay talking about, and that's the Supreme Court itself will move. Some justices will decide, hey, we're really worried about court curbing in the future, and so we're going to flip on, on some cases, change our votes to try to ward off these court curbing efforts. Some people believe that Chief Justice Roberts did that in NFIB versus Sebelius. This was the case where the court upheld the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Some people believe that Chief Justice Roberts thought the individual mandate was unconstitutional, but voted the other way in order to protect, protect the public's perception of the Supreme Court. Some people also believe the Supreme Court did the same thing, or much the same thing, in the civil rights era. After the court's decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, the court was widely criticized. Many people are aware of the massive resistance in the South. And after that decision, and, and even with Brown too and all deliberate speed, many people believe the court backtracked either did not decide some cases or at least pulled its punches because of fears of court permanent efforts. I call this a legitimacy dilemma. The idea that to save the public perception of the court, what some people call its sociological legitimacy, justices will vote in a way that they think is legally incorrect. That is compromise their legal legitimacy. I think this has happened in our history, and I think there are reasons to be very concerned about it happening in the future. Now, either way, whether there is court curbing back and forth, the Supreme Court's in a pit for tat, or the Supreme Court starts pulling its punches on decisions, either way, that's bad for judicial independence. So what does judicial independence mean? Judicial independence, um, at least in part, typically means what we call decisional independence. It's the idea that a judge can issue a decision on the law without worrying about political backlash, without worrying about getting fired, without worrying about attacks on that judge's institution. And this is independence that our courts have, have enjoyed for a long time. Now, not always in our history, there have been attacks on the courts in the past, but particularly in the last half century, our federal judiciary, and especially the U.S. Supreme Court, has enjoyed incredible decisional independence. So what does that mean? It means a court can rule against the President of the United States. It means a court can invalidate a federal statute. It means a lower court judge can issue a nationwide injunction against the federal government and assume that it will be complied with, even when the Department of Justice argues, as it has been arguing, that the judge lacked jurisdiction to issue that nationwide injunction and was wrong on the merits. These are all manifestations of judicial independence. And my worry, as the rhetoric surrounding the courts changes, my worry is that these manifestations may not last very long. All right, thank you. And so in the interest of fairness, I'll give Dave, Dave and Dylan both a couple minutes to introduce themselves and identify a few topics of a dynamic and relationship between the between Congress and the court. So I will start with Gabe. Thank you, Anthony, and thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I also want to talk about uh, judicial independence and decisional independence, uh, but in a little bit of a different way. 
Um, right now, the, the justices have this ability to go under the radar when it comes to some of the ethical and moral uh, requirements that exist in the other branches, right? So, you know, the justices may be influenced by current rhetoric to, to switch votes or to change their uh, opinions in certain cases. Um, and we can debate the merits of that. Um, but I think that public pressure is actually valid and important when you look at a court that isn't currently upholding the, some of the ethical uh, guidelines that we would hope from a modern uh, a, a modern part of branch of government, right? So that's why I want to bring Congress into it to, to sort of bring it back to the beginning because I think that the justices left to them to their own devices aren't going to all of a sudden uh, change their tune, right? You know, yes, certain justices uh, own stocks, some justices don't own any individual stocks, some justices travel around the world on uh, the dime of, of partisan interest groups uh, on both sides or, uh, you know, teach at law schools that are filing briefs uh, and, and arguing cases before them. Um, and, and, you know, public pressure, you know, and I, I kind of want to be able to split the public pressure, right? I think, you know, pressuring John Roberts to uphold Roe v. Wade, uh, that's, that's, that's something that I, I think is interesting and, and you know, put in a, a bucket over here and just hold it for a second. But I think pressuring John Roberts to convince the rest of uh, the judiciary that they should collectively fi follow the same ethical guidelines that lower court judges follow, I, I think that type of public pressure through Congress, I mean, through us in this room, through us on this panel, through, through our elected representatives, you know, could potentially counteract some of that uh, lack of, um, could, could potentially counteract some of that uh, lack of legitimacy that we're concerned about um, with this lack, of, you know, with this growing lack of decisional in, in independence. So, you know, when you think about Congress, Congress already does so much the impacts what the, what the judiciary does, right? They they set the number of federal judges and justices. They set much of their jurisdiction. They set the federal recusal law. They set um, the judicial misconduct law for lower court judges. Um, but at the same time, you know, th they can go. You know, I think they can go further and. If you know we're we're in this in this space where we're really concerned about what the justices are going to say, what the lower court judges are going to say from a jurisprudential side, let's at the very least lock down, dot our eyes and cross our t's on the ethical concerns that we have. And I think that you know Congress has a role to do that. You know in the in the post Kosinski era, in the in the post you know RBG calling Trump a faker, and the post Clarence Thomas not listing his wife's uh, political activities on his financial disclosure report. All these things have. Uh, uh, imperiled in some part, maybe not the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, but the view that we as the public have of the Supreme Court through these unforced errors. And, you know, while we deal with the, you know, I want to sort of separate it, while we deal with the ju jurisprudential issues on the one side, I, I think that something that, you know, we have the ability to change um, through, you know, lobbying and congressional action and direct actions, you know, sending letters to the court, you know, uh, asking them questions when we see them in public. Um, about why they do certain things, you know. I think I think that that's where we can have an impact to sort of, you know, at least counterbalance some of the uh, some of the um, legitimacy concerns. All right, thank you, Kate. Dylan. Oh, no mic. No mic. Nope. Okay. Good. Sorry. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. So, in the interest of keeping the momentum going, I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, talking, because I'm the least interesting person on the panel, but I do want to add on a couple of items to what has already been said, um, and I want to place the focus a bit more on the other side of the ledger here, which is Congress. Um, I think it's really important to underscore that if Congress, and in particular the Senate, were to move forward with something like court packing, you would not only be inflicting damage on the federal judiciary as an institution, but you would also be inflicting damage upon the Senate and the Congress as an institution, because in this scenario where you have to pass legislation that would expand the number of seats on the Supreme Court, I think everybody in this room would probably agree that you wouldn't have enough votes to do that unless you were to eradicate the legislative filibuster. And in eradicating the legislative filibuster, you have further engaged in the nuclear tit for tat in the Senate and you further undermine kind of what the Senate is supposed to do and what it, it is excuse me what it is supposed to be as an institution 
I don't think that's good for anybody. Um, I'm sure there will be some people in this room who will disagree as to whether uh, that should be done, as to whether the legislative filibuster should be removed or whether seats should be added to the Supreme Court as a matter of uh, redressing past wrongs or as a matter of, well, they did it first type of uh, reasoning. But I don't think any of us can disagree that it would undermine the Senate as an institution in the effort to undermine the judiciary as an institution. I also want to note that toward a uh, Supreme Court that is more accountable to a code of conduct, um, you all, those of you who are staffers in uh, Congress, uh, you all are already making positive overtures in that department. Uh, you probably know that currently there are two standalone bills, one in each chamber, that would uh, I would ask the Administrative Office of the um, Judicial Conference to promulgate a code of conduct that would in fact include uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, last Congress there was a bipartisan bill that came out of the uh, House Judiciary Committee that included the same exact provision. Uh, and in each Congress, uh, going back many Congresses, I don't want to date Senator uh, Chuck Grassley, but he's been doing something very often uh, over the past few sentences. Uh, Congresses, which is to introduce a bill that would create an inspector general for the judiciary. Um, now, again, we can debate the relative merits of that or of a code of conduct, but what I'm trying to underscore here is that Congress has a role to play in trying to ensure that the judiciary and the Supreme Court specifically are more accountable and that we can hold them accountable and that they are more transparent. And I would encourage you all to continue those efforts and to work with folks like us towards continuing those efforts. All right, thank you, Dylan. So I'm going to begin with, it was mentioned by a couple members on the panel about a potential code of conduct for the Supreme Court. And this has been raised a number of times in legislation and by outside advocacy groups. And so the Judicial Conference has been asked about this as well. And the Judicial Conference, in short, is saying, we can't tell the Supreme Court what to do. We are designed to administer for the lower courts, create codes of conduct for the lower courts. In a year-end report several years ago, Chief Justice Roberts hinted that this might be unconstitutional to do so. Um, for people on the panel, what are your reactions to that? What are your thoughts? I mean, the, the Constitution is what five people on SCOTA set say it is, first of all. Um, so I, I think you could get five to nine to agree that it would be constitutional, number one. Number two, Chief Justice Roberts uh, is the chair of the Judicial Conference, so I think that sort of solves some of the issues about the judicial. The judicial conference creates it, and it's blessed by the presiding, you know, the presiding officer, Chief Justice Roberts. Then, it's the Supreme Court creating that code of conduct. And secondly, you know, my the example I always look back to is um, it's in the news these days for some reason. Uh, Watergate. So after Watergate, there were these laws that were passed that tried to you know rein in some of the power or just increase the accountability of the federal government. The ethics, uh, the Ethics and Government Act of '78 is one of them. And in that, it basically said that if you are a top official in any of the three branches, you have to file an annual financial disclosure report. That report is due tomorrow, actually. Um, so very timely, Pamela. Thank you. Um, yeah, good job. So, um, so federal judges didn't like that. Some federal judges in the Fifth Circuit said, uh, well, we don't want to pull one out. So they sued themselves, I guess. It was a, kind of a weird uh, uh, case. It was called Duplantier versus U.S. You can look it up. And uh, eventually, the Fifth Circuit said, no, you got to I think it was district judges that sued, and then it went to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said, no, you, you, know, you have to fill out these reports. There's, there's this compelling interest. And then the Supreme Court, a few years later, denied cert. It was actually appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, we're not touching this. So I think similarly, you know, I think there's a, as much as there's you know, the constitutional issue of one Supreme Court in Article III, um, you know, this is the institutional pressure and the, and the public pressure of saying, like, OK, well, if you know, you're a, a, a lower court judge, and you're on a certain, um, you know, you're, you're you're asked not to speak about politics. Why can't you be a Supreme Court justice and similarly act, uh, asked to not to speak about politics? I mean, the the, the genesis of this is uh, of, of the of the code. It goes back to to the 20s and the ABA, and there's all these different versions of it. Finally, you know, finalized in '73, the the code that the lower court judges follow, and then the Ethics and Government Act of '78, um, you know, referenced it. I think just overall what, what, what you're going to see is that, you know, the, the, the court wants to maintain, to go back to the leg legitimacy argument, its legitimacy in, 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 public, uh, in, in the public view and, and being sort of separate and unique. I mean, it might have worked rhetorically 
It works constitutionally still, obviously, but it might have worked rhetorically 20, 30 years ago, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it really does anymore, especially when each of the justices, every single one of the justices, that's, that's the other really convenient thing about this, has done, done something that has flown in the face of the ethics code. So it's not like we're going after Justice Ginsburg and Justice Gorsuch for saying mean things about Trump and for speaking at Trump Hotel, respectively. Each of them has done something that you know, they probably shouldn't have done. And, you know, no one's getting impeached. It's just saying, and no one's getting investigated because the Judicial Conduct Act doesn't apply to the justices. And again, no one's getting impeached. It's just saying, you're the highest court, follow the highest uh, moral standards. All right, any other comments? Uh, so I'll offer, I'll offer a, couple of, a couple of comments. Um, first, this is not an answer to your question, but I'm just going to disagree that the Constitution is what five justices say it is. Um, I think that each branch of government has an independent role in uh, interpreting and enforcing the Constitution. Um, and Congress can certainly have its own role, and I think that it does. Um, so I'll just disagree with that. But in, in terms of the, the issue, I think a code of conduct would be very helpful in many respects. Um, it saddens me that the judiciary and the Supreme Court has been against it for some time, um, because the Supreme Court could easily institute this itself, and the, the constitutional issue would go away. And I'm, it's not quite clear to me why the Supreme Court is resistant to that. Uh, but they but they have been. So for the constitutional question, I'm going to put on my law professor hat a bit, and you guys are going to have, those of you who went to law school are going to be thinking, oh, man, this is always the answer. It's it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I, think, I think the answer to this question is difficult. Um, so Congress has a tremendous amount of power over the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction. Um, the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction exists with such regulations and such exceptions as the Congress shall make. Uh, it's not clear the extent to which Congress can regulate the Supreme Court writ broad. Um, the Constitution doesn't say a lot about that. Under Article One, Section 8, there is the Necessary and Proper Clause. It says Congress shall have the power to make all laws necessary and proper for effectuating not only its own powers, but all the other powers granted um, to, any, to this, this government and any department thereof. And that would suggest that Congress has some power over the U.S. Supreme Court I think the scope of that power is unclear. Now, there are, are there is already a federal statute on the books. It's been on the books for, for some time that requires recusal. And that, that's, I think, strong support that Congress can do stuff in this area. Um, to institute an entire code of conduct, Congress is regulating the Supreme Court itself and not just aspects of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Um, so I think the constitutional question is hard. Um, I am a very pro-congressional power type person. I tend to think laws should be presumptively valid, um, and so my own my own take would probably be on the side that Congress can do this, um, but I don't want to I, I don't want to hide from the fact that it's it's not an it's not an easy constitutional question, and I would not assume that if if such a law went to the courts that they would necessarily uphold it. And, and to follow up on that, in in your most recent essay, so if people want to grab copies, and we do have a few that are on the end of the table, but. I, I picked a quote out, and you have, and you wrote, "quote The best way to protect judicial legitimacy going forward may be an increased emphasis on the proper role of a lawmaker." So, what did you mean by that? So, I think that one of the biggest problems for the for the Supreme Court right now is the increasing partisanship um, in the White House and at the Capitol. And I'm sure everyone in this room is is, is fully aware of the increasing partisanship. And it's it's it got worse starting in the, the late 1980s into the 1990s, and so we, we've now been doing this for a couple of decades, but it's getting worse, and what we've seen is the partisanship that was affecting the passage of legislation and affecting elections to the presidency and to Congress um, began affecting judicial nominations, and I think it's important to recognize that the, the impact on judicial nominations goes back a couple of decades. You know, I think a lot of us see vividly Merrick Garland, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, but prior to that, there were major fights over appellate court nominations. Uh, and not every single one, um, but there were a number, of, a number of fights. The use of the filibuster increased at the appellate court level, um, starting in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Things, things were bad at the end of the Clinton administration, uh, bad during the George W. Bush administration, from the president's perspective um, of either, either party, um, and got worse. And that's, I think, why the Democrats, the Democratic majority in, in 2013, 2013 abolished the filibuster, and then a Republican Senate majority in 2017 abolished the filibuster for Supreme Court appointments, the first lower court, and then Supreme Court. Um, I think the end result of this is that people start perceiving the judiciary as a political football game. Now, I said that that's, that, that would also be the, 
result of court packing tit for tat. I think it is, we are seeing more and more that that's the result of the nomination process and the confirmation process. And what I was suggesting in very, very general terms, um, in part because I had a page limit, um, and in part because I, I really just wanted to throw, throw out the gauntlet for other ideas. Um, what I was suggesting is that that process needs to be cleaned up. Um, I'm actually a fan of the filibuster. Um, I, I know not everyone is, but kind of like to see it come back. I'm not sure that that's a, that's a, likely, a likely thing. Um, but I will also suggest, and this is not going to make me popular, a lot of things I'm, I'm saying right now are not, not going to make me popular <laughs> in this room, but that's okay. Um, I think that whoever is in the majority, I'm, I'm talking about the majority now or the majority in 2020, um, whoever is in the majority needs, needs to wave the white flag itself. Um, I think that people don't realize how bad it was for the federal judiciary that Merrick Garland was nominated and everyone agreed that he was an eminently qualified jurist. There's nothing wrong with him. This guy was absolutely amazing and was rejected. Prior to that time, the Supreme Court nominees were, were um, there was pushback. There at least was the facade of um, the notion that they weren't qualified or that something was wrong with them, they're extreme, and nobody said that about Merrick Garland, and he was just ousted. And I think that um, Republicans that I've talked to don't understand how angry that made Democrats. Um, and so I think that either the majority now or the majority in 2020, someone someone needs to offer um, offer an olive branch, um, and it has to come from the party that actually has the power to do something, whoever that party is. And to to pivot from that, talking about extending an olive branch, I tried to do a tally last night, but the list of Democratic presidential candidates keeps growing, and it just grew this morning. <laughs> but my at my last tally, o over eight presidential hopefuls are on the record in support of expanding the Supreme Court. So we'll do, I want to do an informal poll just here. Who, who uh, is also in support of court packing, expanding the court to 10, 11, 12, 15, 127? No judgment. Like that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's okay. no judgment. A lot of my students are yeah, in favor yeah. of this, too. And you're not on camera, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so this panel, I can guess, but for the panel as well, if anyone is in support. OK. So what about term limits? Term limits have also been something that's been debated as a policy idea, the most popular being 18-year term limits. What is the support, just the informal poll in the room for term limits for the Supreme Court? Included in the panel as well? On the fence. Okay, I'm sort of agnostic. I have some critiques that I can <laughs> So this is excellent. So we'll start with we'll start with pro, then we'll go to con, and maybe then end up in the middle. So we have Yeah, I mean I think uh, look, we with regard to the Supreme Court and, and ending life tenure, um, you know, this is this it's actually a, nationwide is a very popular idea. You go to Iowa, you go to you know, New York, you even, even in D.C., it's about two-thirds uh, to 70 percent of both parties. We do a lot of polling. Fix the Court does a lot of polling. So, you know, cross, cross partisan lines. It's really popular in, in the 2015-2016 presidential race on the Republican side. Now it's popular in the 2019-2020 race on the Democratic side. Um, and, you know, look, it's, it's the federal judiciary is the third branch, and it's third for a reason. And the idea that you have individuals serving on the court now for 30, 35 years is not what I believe our, our, our founders intended, uh, you know, maybe John Marshall's tenure aside, but, you know, overall, just having, um, you know, a, a lack of, well, a few things. First of all, you know, having justices serve for life increases the chances that, you know, some of them is gonna, one of them is going to have uh, you know, cognitive decline or what you see right now, what you see, see in previous administrations, that justices are sort of hanging on past their primes. Uh, waiting for the next uh, occupant of the White House with whom they agree to fill that to fill their seats, um, as you saw with uh, you know, Justice Scalia uh, last uh, presidency and, and Justice Ginsburg this presidency, um, you know, having a, a, that's the thing is too is like we're not you know supporters of term limits that have real proposals aren't trying to say okay every four years let's get a new 
back to justices. I think that would be too much uh, change in, in, the, in the direction of the law. But having an 18-year term where you're on the court long enough to make several important opinions, have those on your, on your belt, but not so long as to become a dinosaur, uh, you'd be able to rotate off, right? So you're not mo most serious term limits proposals with the Supreme Court maintain life tenure for those justices who are rotating off. And like in the 19th century, um, they would ride circuit or like Souter and uh, O'Connor, they would go to the, to the first or ninth circuit respectively like those two, two did after their term, after their time on SCOTUS ended. And, and so there's, there's ways to do it that you know, maintains the, the respect of the judiciary's legitimacy, its independence while not creating, um, while not maintaining this institution with concentrated power in the hands of the very, very old and very few. All right, Dylan. Sure. Uh, so just as a disclaimer, I hate doing things like this because I hate when other people do it, but I'm not officially representing the Constitution <laughs> Project or the Project on Government Oversight when I say this particular thing, so I'm taking that hat off, as it were. Uh, I'm somewhat agnostic on the 18-year term limits. I know that, uh, Gabe, you did mention that um, there, the idea of having regularized every four-year nominations is not a serious proposal, but, but that is a common proposal in a lot of um, the literature or in the articles or even in presidential candidates right now that you see talking about it, they will mention the, as a reason why 18-year term limits is, is a good idea, is because it would regularize two appointments for every four-year administration, so there would be some semblance of uh, fairness, so each administration would know that it gets two appointments. Um, but even if you set that aside, with an 18-year term limit, you do know exactly when there is going to be an opening on the Supreme Court. And one of my biggest concerns about that is that we're, one goal I think we should have is to try to depoliticize the Supreme Court. <laughs> and if you know exactly when there are going to be openings on the Supreme Court, you then immediately create an incentive for the next election cycle to be, if not primarily, at least largely about that Supreme Court seat. And I could, I could imagine a world that I'm sure many of us here could too, where <coughs> presidential candidate X has a ticket that includes vice presidential candidate Y, and oh, here are my two Supreme Court picks that I'm also going to nominate when I get into office if you vote for me. And I think that would actually do more damage to the Supreme Court if we are in fact trying to make the Supreme Court less of a partisan political arena and more of an independent uh, judiciary. Uh, so that's kind of one of my big critiques. I know there are others, but I'll let other people speak to those if they'd like to. That's a um, So I think one question, I, and I, I don't often hear people talk about this, is do we mean just the Supreme Court or do we mean all courts? Um, and I think that's something people should think about. Do you want, do you want term limits 18 some odd years just for the Supreme Court or do you want it across the board? Um, I've often been very sympathetic to term limits um, uh, well before the current current divides over the federal judiciary because I, I think some judges do serve way too long. Uh, a huge advantage of term limits is it could encourage presidents to nominate people who have who are older, more experienced. We wouldn't have to worry about nominating 50-year-olds to the U.S. Supreme Court or 40-year-olds or now people younger than me <laughs> to the courts of appeals. Um, and that might be a good thing to the extent people have more experience. Um, it wouldn't necessarily uh, necessarily fix things, but I think that that could be a very good thing, and I think having some turnover could be helpful too for the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and for that reason, I've, I've often been very sympathetic. I, I think the terms would have to be at least 18 years. I think 24 might be a good idea, um, but the, ha I think there would be enough independence created by lengthy terms. My concerns are um, similar to Dylan's. Um, right now, I think it would be seen as a reaction against what's currently happening in the Supreme Court. And it would be it would, I think it'd be better to have term limits come up in a different environment, although change only comes up when people, people are really, really motivated for it. And most of the proposals for 18-year terms do rely on a new appointment every two years. And for those of you who have recently experienced um, the confirmation fights over Garland, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, um, imagine doing that all the time. <laughs> Um, which is in fact what would happen in the Senate. And so when I've talked to political scientists and, and also federal judges about this, they're extremely worried about the impact that that would have on the courts and also the impact that that would have on Congress and specifically the United States Senate. 
We also do not know for sure when appointments would happen because judges could always decide to retire. Die. Um, and so they, they could time their retirements in such a way that people wouldn't necessarily get the nice two-year even, even-handedness. Um, and so it might not get the result that, that people want. The final thing I'll say, though, is I feel very, very strongly that this would have to be done by a constitutional amendment. Many of the proposals are for federal statutes, and they are extremely creative, um, and I think very, very plausible. I also think they are wrong and unconstitutional. I do not believe it is constitutional to tell a Supreme Court justice you can be a Supreme Court justice for 18 years, and guess what, after that, um, not by your choice, but by the choice of, of this federal statute, you will no longer serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, you can serve on the lower federal courts. Um, I do not believe that that is what good behavior in Article Three means. I'm not saying there aren't arguments for it, I think there are, um, but I feel very strongly that it would have to be done by constitutional amendment, um, which would require a tremendous amount of political support that I don't think we have. <coughs> And so a lot of the discussion today is focused on the confirmation bias in the Senate and a lot of um, Democratic frustration with Republicans' use of the nuclear option to change rules recently, the um, quick pace of nominations, confirmations that have happened in the past. But there are also a few things to consider. Um, as of yesterday, there were 123 vacancies in the U.S. District Courts, the lower trial courts for the federal judiciary. Over 70 of those districts are facing what the judicial conferences call judicial emergencies because of their high caseloads and long-term vacancies. Um, vacancies do cause real-world harm. Delays cause hardship on individuals and businesses. Some can't afford long-time litigation delays. But let's even assume every single district position is filled. The judicial conferences told us that's not even enough. The last significant courts bill that added judgeships to the judiciary was in 1990, so nearly 20 years ago. Since then, filings have gone up 30%. Populations have exploded in states such as California, where the Judicial Conference has requested 20 more judges. And so how do we remedy the legitimate concern about rule changes and norm changes and the pace of judicial confirmations with also the legitimate concern of long-term vacancies, crushing caseloads, and people suffering from not being able to litigate in federal courts. If anyone wants to. Well, I mean, I think you, you can answer that question yourself because of the, your essay on magistrates. I think that, you know, we always think about SCOTUS, uh, courts of appeals, and district judges, but there's also magistrates that um, have been around for about 50 years more formally, and they can handle some of the caseloads and don't need, um, I mean, they need some, you know, they're, they're it's, it's a lot less controversial to, to, to add a magistrate judge because they're not life tenured for, among other reasons, than it would be for a district judge. Um, so I think, you know, check it out, Anthony Markham. He had a, a good essay on that, I think, in the Washington. Uh, I think Examiner. We'll go with Examiner. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a possible solution. The other thing is, um, I think being presidential, you know, again, Congress is, has to step in. The last bill was 1990. Uh, uh, Brooks and Smith, the two, uh, uh, it's a bipartisan bill from uh, two guys from Texas, a Republican and a Democrat. There, you know, they're they're gone. They're not here anymore, unfortunately. But having, you know, sort of being agnostic as to who's appointing the judges, I think would also be helpful. So if you stagger, you know, if you had ten judges a year, every other year for twenty years, or whatever the numbers are, um, you know, we well, can go to fixthecourt.com. We have a proposal on that too. But uh, you know. Just getting used to this idea that that you know we may not have the the you know it, it's politically toxic to add all sixty five right now, but it, you know if we add six in this year, maybe twelve in the few years down the line, it's it, it's less so. But you know yeah, access to justice is an issue all across the country, and um, you know un unfortunately we're in a situation where you can't just create a, a, a judgeship out of whole cloth and need congressional help. And I think that that's something that I'm glad that you're, I'm really glad that you brought up today. All right, any other comments? I just want to reaffirm that Anthony's article on magistrates was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and you should read it. And oh, of sorry, course, guys. the one thing it does require uh, if you were to uh, give the AO the authority to hire judges is money. And I know money is often hard to come by. If we have any appropriators in the room, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think it's probably easier to find the money to hire magistrates than it is to create new judgeships in the current environment that's already been outlined quite nicely around uh, nominations and confirmations. If you 
it's also important to recognize there have been um, proposals for new judgeships, and I think some of those proposals have actually suggested that the new judgeships be created after the 2020 election and starting in 2021, um, such that no one would know exactly which president could, could appoint those. And I think some of those bills have not gone anywhere because they contained judicial ethics provisions that, um, that the Federal Judicial Conference uh, opposed. So that in all fairness to Congress, I think, I think members of Congress have been trying and the judiciary has, has not been willing to compromise. And so another, another aspect that a lot of core reformers have looked at is increasing judicial transparency. Um, right now, if you were to attend an argument at the U.S. Supreme Court, attend in person, you're not going to get the transcript until that afternoon, and you're not going to get the audio until that Friday. And so a lot of people have been working on this for a long period of time, and sometimes the most popular debate has been cameras in the courtroom. But there have been also alternatives. So I know some people in this room have worked on that extensively, so it's fair to give Gabe the first shot at this one. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Um, that we're still in, in, 2020, in 2019 and we, we are not able to watch uh, the justices on, on C-SPAN 4. I always thought that was, that was kind of strange and growing up and, and started, all, started a whole organization around it um, uh, in, in my 30s. So, you know, I, look, I think that the justices are, I think there, there are two main challenges. One, one is generational, right? So you have justices that are maybe mid-50s and younger that, you know, grew up with the ubiquity of television in ways that justices that are maybe mid-60s and older hadn't. So I think that's one of the challenges um, that you have. Also, um, you know, and right in the middle of that is, is you know, one, one thing when you think about cameras in the courtroom, you know, they're all, justices are always asked this when they appear at public events. Um, you know, and the, the answer that always irks me is, is, the, is the Justice Thomas answer, which is, you know, I, I don't want cameras in the courtroom because I've already lost my anonymity. Everyone knows who, you know, who I am, and I don't want the rest of the judiciary to also lose their anonymity. They're public servants. They're, they're, this is ridiculous that they, that they should be anonymous, like, first of all. Second of all, Justice Thomas is not recognized at all when he goes in his annual uh, RV trips across the country. So, uh, there, you know, there's that as well. But, you know, and, and if there's a concern of justices being, you know, recognized because they're on, on television 62 times a year for an hour each, uh, you know, well, maybe with opinion announcements it would be up to 75, but they're, they're hearing fewer and fewer cases, but that's, that's probably a different panel. Um, you know, so then increased security for the justices, right? The justices are, are very well secured in D.C., but as soon as they leave D.C., security is opt-in for them, right? It's up to them to call up the U.S. Marshals or the Marshal of the Supreme Court to call up the U.S. Marshals to say, hey, Justice Breyer is going to Boston, uh, you know, get to uh, dispatch to, uh, to uh, deputy marshals to D.C. to, to, to escort them there. So. Um, you know, th that argument just doesn't make any sense to me. Also, the apples to oranges argument that you have with C what C-SPAN's done to Congress. You know, C-SPAN, we have, you know, our, uh, our friends at C-SPAN uh, was just here, he just left, but, you know, they've been around for about 40 years, and everyone says, oh, since C-SPAN occurred, you know, Congress has been less, uh, less cordial. Okay, maybe, but, you know, the people in Congress who are on C-SPAN are using C-SPAN to run for office. They're using C-SPAN to convince their constituents or their colleagues you know, who are all watching um, or now seeing clips on Twitter about a specific policy proposal. That doesn't exist at the Supreme Court, right? At the Supreme Court, you're there for, you know, an hour, and there's just, you know, no time for any sort of shenanigans. There just isn't. If you've ever been to an argument that you see, there's no charts, there's no, you know, uh, I forget the Mike Lee charts that I love with, you know, people like writing, uh, whatever that was a few weeks ago, but... <laughs> Ronald you, Reagan with a machine gun. Ronald Reagan, you know, yeah. Justice Scalia... Make your all would be Scalia, but uh, you know, ju you know, Justice Ginsburg is not going to come up with a, a, a you know, Bill Clinton with you know with the machine gun as a chart behind her during uh, an ERISA case. Like it's just not going to happen. So it's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison. We get it. The justices are, are, are old school. They're not going to implement cameras right now. That's fine. But the technology exists in the courtroom right now, across the street as we speak, for live audio. The live audio already goes to to one or two places in the building the audio stream during an argument, during an opinion announcement. SCOTUS has the technology, go to livestream.supremecourt.gov, they have the technology to live stream from the website to the rest of the country so we can listen to these cases contemporaneously. And we obviously know they have the ability to do audio, to do same day audio because they've, they've done it 27 times in the last uh, 19 years, most recently for the, the travel ban case uh, last April. So. Again, you know, if, if we're trying to, 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 to demystify the court, to, to raise the level of civic engagement, civic education, 
to, to make it not seem that the justices are, are politicians in robes, you know, that you have Alito and Kagan agreeing a lot more than, than probably the average American thinks. In order to do that, increasing the, the very basic technology that allows Americans to, to, to interact, to see, to hear the justices live as, as the cases unfold, as the arguments unfold, I think is, is uh, something that would, the, the court, I think, would, uh, would benefit itself from, not only the American people. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Too kind. What was amusing is that <coughs> the justices often say when they're during their confirmation hearings, "Oh yeah, can you to the courtroom? Oh, that'd be fine." And as soon as they get on the bench, they say, "Oh no, <laughs> they don't want to be on television." But I think for all the reasons you gave, um, they I think there, that would be a great thing. And I, I also has, has anyone in the room been to an oral argument? So I used to do this for a living. These are deathly boring. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that the Supreme Court would constantly be watched is, is, is um, I think, I think somewhat, somewhat laughable. I think they're worried about the big time cases that would be watched, but I think there might be a lot of benefits to seeing how the judges conduct themselves during during those arguments. I would just add, uh, recently both Justice Alito and Justice Kagan appeared at a um, House Appropriations Subcommittee uh, hearing to talk about why they needed money. Um, and I found them both very adorable and relatable. Uh, Justice Alito knocked over a glass, and it was a whole funny thing. So I think in some ways it could also humanize the yeah. um, mm -hmm. people who have widely been viewed as sort of spitting on high and uh, kind of casting judgment from the uh, the cosmos up there. But they're not. They're humans, and they're they're relatable, and they're important figures. And I think the public certainly wants and deserves access to them in that way. Was that event on C-SPAN by any chance? It sure was, yeah. Was the room full? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in the, in the last few minutes, um, we're, we're just going to take, we'll do a question and answer session. So if anyone wants to ask a question, just feel free to raise your hand and we'll, so yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, uh, I'm hoping Gabe could expand a little bit on the proposal that spouses, the information about the political activities of spouses of justices, and I assume judges uh, should be made public as a matter of ethics. I mean, Justice Thomas's wife is a conservative political activist, but in a few years we might have a justice whose spouse is an ACLU official. Is this arguably a sort of pre-feminist argument, a Caesar's wife argument that you, you want to judge judges by what their independent opinionated spouses are doing? What's the public good? Is it a conflict of interest problem that their spouses are involved in things that come before them? Is it an appearances problem that you just don't like aesthetically, the idea that a justice's spouse is out doing politics? Um, we had a big controversy about whether an FBI official's wife could run for Congress. Um, President Trump made something of that. So talk a little bit more about this proposal. Sure. So yeah, in the in the annual financial disclosure reports, which are due tomorrow, mark your calendars. There's a section that says, uh, you know, spouses' income, basically, where you're required to report. And again, when we say requirement, like the Supreme Court can do whatever it wants. So it's not like again, no one's going to impeach. The only punishment for a justice is impeachment and removal, and no one's going to get impeached over leaving off spousal income. But you know, two things. First, so, so yeah, it says, you know, what does your spouse do? And, and I don't remember if it says like, how much the salary they make, but like, what is what is your spouse's uh, uh, primary source of income? So um, I think it might have started as a, as, a, as a Caesar's wife argument, but you know, the fact that you are going to have these couples who run in, in, in you know the same circles, high level circles in D.C. You know, I, I think it, it it behooves the public to just ask the question. You know, if you're uh, if you're working, if you're a partner at Gibson, if you're a you know, um, if you're a partner at Gibson Dunn as as a spouse, you know, and there's a Gibson Dunn case before the court, you know, maybe that's worth looking at. Now the justice actually did sort of, you know, uh, uh, preempt that argument because they signed in 1993, and this has been updated, uh, uh, a letter that said seven of them signed it because seven of them had uh, lawyer uh, spouses or kids said, look, we've got lawyer spouses and kids. We're not going to automatically recuse, just to use Gibson Dunn, every time Gibson Dunn has a case before the court. But if our kid, uh, you know, uh, sorry to pick on Gibson Dunn, but Gene Scalia works at Gibson Dunn. If, like, you know, Gene Scalia was working on an Exxon case and there's an Exxon case, I'm, I'm going to recuse. But it's not going to be automatic. So I think it just, 
that, that, that lever is always what I think about when I think about that section of the financial disclosure report because I, I think that, you know, we, again, we don't want to impugn the justice's character unnecessarily, but I think it is worth having that conversation, that discourse about it um, because, you know, there are different levels of, of, of spousal involvement that are problematic. Like, you know, Ginny Thomas working for the Heritage Foundation Daily Caller is not problematic. You know, sending out resumes for uh, uh, positions in the Bush administration while Bush versus Gore is going on might be a little problematic. Um, but it's, it was illegal when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was hearing cases uh, based on Marty's stock investments, and then you know someone found, figured out in 1994 and he sold all those stocks. And again, illegal in quotes because you know the justices make their their own sort of rules. Just so to follow up. Yeah. I, I misspoke. I think it was the, the wife of the FBI official, state right? senator or something. State yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But would would that be in your in your bracket of what should be disclosed? That's not something that involves cases that no. come before the court. No, but if, I mean, if they politics. But again, a lot, a lot of, again, so a lot of this I think is, you know, Congress should do X, Y, and Z, but a lot of this is like, you know, in, in the in the op-ed pages of, of, of major metropolitan papers and in public discourse, it's worth at least having, like, thinking about, you know, look, if, if, if my, my line has always been, if the Supreme Court's going to decide who's the president, who lives and dies, where we can pray, where we can vote, they're a political branch. So they're a political branch, we, they deserve the same amount of scrutiny that the other two branches have. And that, part of that is, Maybe not passing a law saying I need to know, you know, X, you know, who's donating to, to or who's donating to ex spouse's campaign because I mean we have open secrets for that. But at least talking about it in a way that that doesn't presume that they get a free pass. Okay, we'll do another. Yes, sir. Uh, you all want to talk about the idea of a code of ethics, and I think you would like the justices of the Supreme Court to behave ethically. Doesn't that idea work against the, the very notion of a judicial independence and judicial so, so it's, it's a very good question. This came up when, um, when Congress was creating the Code of Ethics for the lower federal courts. Um, are we kind of interfering with the, with the, with the courts? Um, the Code of Ethics, though, is, is asking you to do things that one would expect a judge to do anyway. That is, not become in politics, um, not have financial shenanigan, shenanigans, um, and be, a, be an upstanding citizen. Um, and so I think, I think that for most judges, it would not be a big deal to comply with the code of ethics. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also important to remember that the code of ethics was promulgated by the ABA, and it's and it's predicated on some just like basic tenets of kind of judicial conduct, and it doesn't prescribe in any way sort of what judicial philosophy or constitutional interpretive ideology you must have. It just says you shouldn't be doing things like speaking out in public in, in, in uh, political campaigns and things like that, uh, financial conflicts of interest, et cetera. So, I mean, I understand what, what you're getting at there, but there is decisional independence, which uh, Professor Grove spoke very importantly about, but then there's also these are public servants who we've tasked with a pretty uh, Herculean feat and a very important one, and so at the very least we should be able to expect it that they do adhere to some kind of basic code of ethics. Yep. Um, I understand that the kind of court expansion proposals by like Buttigieg and Beto are really unlikely to pass, um, but would um, proposals like that where judges are unanimously agreed upon to be added to the court, would those, if they were to somehow be passed, would they be effective in limiting partisanship and stuff like that on the court today? Do you mean if, if court packing happened, would that? Well, like not necessarily just court packing, but changing the structure of the court so that like judges have to be unanimously agreed upon by the existing judges, would that be effective in limiting partisanship? Um, so I think you're talking about the proposal that some people have called the balanced bench idea, um, such that five justices would be picked by Democrats, five by Republicans, and the other five by the first 10. Um, first, I'll say that that is highly likely unconstitutional under Article Two of the Constitution, which says that the president um, shall, by and with the consent of the Senate, appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Now, there are a lot of things in the US Constitution that are vague, but the US Constitution explicitly says the president shall, by and with the consent of the Senate, appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Um, and it, it's, it's hard to get more specific than that, which means that 
five, ten members of the U.S. Supreme Court couldn't appoint the other five. Um, so that's one problem with that proposal. I think for, for me when I read about that proposal, a second problem is it presumes that politics is fixed in time. We currently have a Republican Party and a Democratic Party. We have not always had those parties, and those parties have not always been what they are today. Um, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to fix the Supreme Court on something that may very well change over time um, and preclude the idea that there may be different parties in the future. Great, and so we'll do time for one more question. Sir? I have some questions about the idea of term limits. First, do any of the proposals for term limits allow for the possibility of reappointment of an incumbent justice, someone who has 18 years of experience as a justice? And second, how do the arguments for term limits for Supreme Court justices compare with the arguments for term limits for members of Congress or state legislators? Yeah, uh, in terms of reappointment, I n no, I, I don't. I, I think that uh, if you have an 18 year term and there's a second 18 year term, then you serve 36 years, which would be longer than any justice has ever served on the Supreme Court, um, William O. Douglas territory. When Senator Ted Cruz ran for president, uh, he did propose a retention election, though, which is kind of yeah, I think it was like 10 years and then, yeah, yeah, then another yeah, yeah. retention. Yeah. And retention elections obviously happen at the state court level. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I, I can't recall any, any um, plans that have an 18-year term and a, and a potential for reappointment. Um, in terms of, you know, congressional term limits versus Supreme Court term limits. I mean, technically there already are congressional term limits in the sense that the voters can vote a guy out or a gal out after two or six years. So. I, I do think they're, they're a little bit of a separate argument. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I think that one of the nice things about 18 years is that it sort of mirrors, you know, it's three senatorial terms, it's nine congressional terms. Um, but, you know, if, if there is an issue with a member of, you know, the House or Senate, there's a, there's a fairly easy way to remove him or her within a, within a short amount of time to make them more responsive to his or her constituents. You don't want the Supreme Court to be that responsive to the constituents. You want them to be a little bit, but not that much. So I think having a long enough term uh, makes more sense than on, on the congressional level where, where there are these, are these periodic elections. So I, I, think, I think they're different. I know that a lot of people like to lump them together. I know there's groups that try to lump them together. It's not something that I'm personally interested in. I kind of like to think of them as two separate issues. And um, you know, I, I vote against my member of Congress all the time. So you know, it's, uh, <laughs> All right, so I'm, unfortunately we have to leave it there, but thank you everyone for attending, and thank you for the panelists for attending as well. Um, you do have, you should have comment cards um, on your seat, underneath your seat. Please fill those out. You can leave them here on the table. It's really helpful for us for your, to get your feedback. And there are also a few copies of Professor Grove's essay that she discussed at the beginning. So thank you again. <laughs>